raise your hand if someone you know has suffered with Alzheimer's. How about heart disease? Cancer? Stroke? That's a lot of hands. The standard approach for tackling diseases like this is to use animal models for drug discovery and testing. But what if I told you that 95% of drugs tested in animals actually fail in humans? Biomedical research is in a translation crisis, but how did we get here? I'm Elizabeth Ormondy, and I've spent the last 15 years unraveling our animal-based science systems. What I've come to learn is that we need to change the way science is taught, practiced, and regulated. Today, I invite you to come on a journey that explores the persistent use of animal models, why they are failing, and what we can do. And it all starts way back in your childhood with a science education practice that at first glance might seem unrelated. Now, raise your hand if you did animal dissection in your school science classes. Most of you. And so our story begins. There is a deeply held assumption that traditional animal dissection is the best way to learn anatomy and body systems. So dissection remains prevalent in our schools and universities. However, there is compelling evidence to show that non-animal teaching methods, like virtual anatomy tools, are better for education, less costly for school budgets, safer and more inclusive for students, and they're the greener option in terms of their environmental impact. They are also the ethical option, and here's why. There are three principles that guide the ethical use of animals in science and science education, and they're called the three R's, replacement, reduction, refinement. And I'm going to zero in on replacement for a moment. This principle tells us that if we can meet our scientific or educational goals without using animals, it is an ethical obligation to use non-animal methods. Empirical data from the last 15 years shows that 90% of students do just as well and in most cases better when they use non-animal teaching methods compared to dissection. So, under the principle of replacement, dissection should have ended 10 years ago, case closed. But here's the rub. Science teachers are not taught about the three R's in their teacher training programs, and students are not taught about the three R's in early science education. So the harmful and unnecessary practice of dissection persists. So we need to change how science is taught in two key ways. First, by ending the unnecessary practice of dissection. Second, by making sure that the three R's are taught and adhered to in early science education. And by doing so, I think that we can avoid scenes like this, where animal life is taken for no discernible educational benefit, and what's more, this animal life is being disrespected. Instead, I believe that we can raise a generation of young scientists who are encouraged to lean into the natural empathy and compassion that they have for animals, rather than being asked to dissociate themselves from these qualities in the name of science. So in 2018, I established Canada's first humane science education program. This program teaches K through 12 life science education, including internal anatomy, without using a single real animal. And here's what humane science education looks like. We use virtual anatomy tools, these beautiful paper dissections, plastic anatomy models, and augmented and virtual reality technology. But what does any of this have to do with the failure of animal models in drug development? 
Well, I've come to learn that it's all about the prevailing science culture. I want you to imagine that you are back in grade six. You've just done a frog dissection and you were kind of grossed out, but your scientific curiosity won the day. Fast forward to grade 12, and this time you want to opt out of doing the fetal pig dissection, but your teacher strongly encourages you to take part. She knows that you want to go on and do biology at university. So you do dissection for the second time. You go on to your chosen undergraduate degree, then a master's degree and a PhD. All the while, you carry with you an implicit assumption that the right way, the best way to do science is to kill animals and take them apart. No one along the way challenges that assumption. And in fact, since grade six, you've been taught that animal models are the gold standard and that using them in science is a necessary evil. You are now a lead principal investigator. You have your own lab, you're studying Alzheimer's and you're using mice for research and drug development. You get government grants. You test one experimental drug after another. You kill hundreds of mice. Time passes. Five years, 10 years, 15. You make no new breakthroughs. Animal models of Alzheimer's fail close to 100% of the time. And in fact, data from a range of different biomedical disciplines studying sepsis, stroke, multiple sclerosis, HIV AIDS, heart disease, depression, asthma, cancer, and so on, show that on average, 95% of drugs tested in animals go on to fail in human clinical trials, 95%. Think of all those tax dollars, all those animals, all those failed patients for few to no new treatments. Since grade six, you've been taught that animal models are the gold standard in science. They're not. They're failing us. But why? Well, there are two main reasons. The first relates to sloppy science practices. The second relates to insurmountable species differences. So let me talk about sloppy science for a minute. There's a phenomenon called confirmation bias, and this describes a tendency to seek out or give greater weight to data points that confirm hypotheses. There are two important experimental techniques for avoiding confirmation bias, and they're called randomization and blinding. In the context of animal-based research, randomization is when researchers randomly allocate animals to different treatment groups. Blinding is when researchers do not know which animal received which treatment. Now, there is evidence to show that researchers who use animal models for drug development, in many cases, are not using randomization and blinding, so they're not controlling for confirmation bias. What this means is that in studies with no randomization and no blinding, there is a significant and inaccurate overestimate of the clinical effect of a drug. Researchers are finding their desired clinical outcome where there is none because they did not control for confirmation bias. And it is inaccurate data like this that is used to make decisions about whether novel drugs are advanced to clinical trials in humans. And in many cases, ineffective drugs are permitted to proceed. Now, this is not a newfound phenomenon. This has been well documented since at least the late 1990s. But despite this particular sloppy science practice being highlighted more than two decades ago, a report from just this year showed that more than 90% of animal studies exploring new drugs for COVID-19 failed to report blinding. 
So we really need to change our science practices and make sure that experimental techniques to control bias are used every single time. Lives quite literally depend on it. The second and most important reason that animal models fail is because animals often don't make good stand-ins for humans. So even if we did the most rigorous animal-based studies with all the randomization and all the blinding, in many cases, species differences simply cannot be overcome. So what can we do then if animals don't make good models for human biology? Well, there are groundbreaking, human-relevant, non-animal methods that are being developed, and they overcome species differences by using human cells and human tissues that can be collected non-invasively and with consent. And I have a few favorites to share with you. Organs on a chip. This is the lung on a chip developed at Harvard's Vice Institute. And the channels in the chip have living human lung cells on one side and capillary blood vessel cells on the other. So despite appearances, the chip mimics functional human lung tissue. This device has been used to identify new disease biomarkers, and it can be used to develop new treatments for conditions like chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder and asthma. And there are other chips, heart on a chip, liver on a chip, blood-brain barrier on a chip, and there are researchers who are linking chips together to observe multi-system effects in human cells and human tissues. There are organoids. These are miniature functional organ units that grow into 3D spherical shapes. The ones pictured here are brain organoids, and they've been used by researchers to better understand autism and schizophrenia. Most recently, brain organoids were used to explore the neurobiological impact of COVID-19. And there are other organoids, intestinal, kidney, ovarian, and many more. This is a 3D bioprinter. It works much the same as the 3D printers that you're probably more used to, the ones that use plastic polymers. But instead, bioprinters use something called bioink, which contains human cells. So as it prints, cells are layered and they can be printed into 3D functional human tissue. 3D bioprinters have been used to print small sections of human trachea, that's the windpipe, to study chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder. They've been used to print neural tissue, to study neurodegenerative disorders and to study spinal cord injury. And there are many more applications as well. Human-relevant, non-animal technologies like these are changing the shape of, uh, changing the face of science in profound ways. However, they are not being taught to our undergraduate science students in any meaningful or systematic way. I wanted to change that. So I created and now teach Canada's first undergraduate science course that is fully focused on non-animal methods in biomedical science. And my hope is that talented young scientists will carry this knowledge forward and will shift their own science practices in favor of non-animal methods. Progress on the development and adoption of non-animal technologies is being made primarily in countries that have a legislative foundation governing the use of animals in science. So, for example, in the European Union, all EU member states answer to the EU directive on the protection of animals used for scientific purposes. That directive is very clear, that the ultimate goal is the replacement of animals in science. In Canada, we have no such legislation. And I firmly believe that this lack of a legislative framework is hindering some much needed progress here. So we need to change how animal-based science is governed and move towards a legislated system, one which prioritizes non-animal methods by codifying replacement into law, 
but one that also ensures that any remaining animal-based science is held to much more rigorous standards than we are currently seeing. And I'm deeply committed to being on the forefront of that conversation. So to recap, we need to change science education. We need to end the unnecessary practice of dissection. We need to make sure that the three R's are taught and adhered to in early science education. And we need to make sure that our undergraduate students are being taught about non-animal methods. We need to change how science is practiced and include much more rigorous experimental design in animal studies, but most importantly, make sure that non-animal methods are being made top priority, and that starts with our research funders. And we need to change how animal-based science is regulated and move towards a legislated system. In 2015, together with some incredible colleagues, we co-founded Canada's first charity that works solely on the issues that I've presented here today. We are called the Society for Humane Science, and I could not be more proud of the work that we do. In my closing moments with you, I want to leave you with this. Even though you may never have heard about these issues before, they affect you and you're part of them through everything from the taxes that you pay, which fund animal research, to the medical or chemical products that you purchase or interact with on a daily basis, to the loved ones you've lost because of failed animal experiments. And I know that pain well. I've lost them too. My hope here today is that I've inspired you to research these issues for yourself, to get curious about science education and how drugs are developed, and to start exercising your voice where you can. Because we are called on to do nothing short of changing science culture. And while there is indeed a growing global movement that seeks to achieve better science without animals, we cannot do that without collective political will. I can't do that without you. Thank you.